great to join you this morning. Um, and uh, so I, I, I was here last night, and uh, somebody said they were looking forward to the mixed martial arts cage match this morning. <laughs> I don't know what they're talking about. Um, you know, it's hard to, even though we're we're in the Sheraton this year, uh, not the Cavalier. It's hard for me to stand here and not reflect back one year ago, because if you remember, the Young Lawyers Division traditionally hosts the first Attorneys General debate of the election, and last year was no difference, and uh, a lot has happened in that year, uh, and uh, I'm a whole lot more relaxed this time. <laughs> uh, I would like to take a moment and thank the State Bar for inviting me and uh, giving me an opportunity to deliver uh, some opening remarks to sort of set the table, if you will, for I think uh, what will be an informative panel discussion and very timely. And um, as you might imagine, I have a fair amount of observations to to, uh, to make on, on the topic today, and so I think probably I'll just dive right in, if that's all right. And I think one of the best places to start, because the, the job of Attorney General is often not well understood, I think it's helpful to maybe talk just a moment uh, to get into the topic about the, the history of the Office of Attorney General. And it actually has a very storied past. Um, it started back in the courts of medieval England, uh, when kings and queens figured out very quickly that it was a good idea to hire a lawyer to protect their money and property in court. And over time, as um, England developed, uh, that became an official appointment with staff and deputies and assistants. And um, the, the function was to protect and defend the interests of the king and the crown. And that uh, crossed the Atlantic and in colonial America. And, um, but uh, when the revolution occurred and the United States was established, something very fundamental changed in the role of Attorney General. And instead of defending and protecting the interests of the king in America, the job of the Attorney General became to defend and protect the interests of the public. And so the Attorney General in America has become the guardian of the public interest. I also think it's helpful uh, in getting into the, the topic to talk about sort of the, the context in which the marriage equality cases in Virginia are, are coming up. And if you remember, about this time last summer, the U.S. Supreme Court decided two cases, the Proposition 8 case and the Windsor case. And shortly after that, uh, two lawsuits were filed, one in the Western District of Harrisonburg, one in the Eastern District of Norfolk, challenging Virginia's ban on marriage for same-sex couples. And those were proceeding in the fall uh, at, during the election. And uh, some of you may remember mine was a pretty close one and uh, was not finally resolved uh, until after a recount uh, about a week before Christmas. And by that time, uh, the, the uh, court in Norfolk was setting oral argument in the Bostick case on cross motions for summary judgment, and I think it was scheduled for January 30th. So when the recount was finished, uh, I knew very uh, early that we would need to, to make a decision very promptly upon being sworn in about what position uh, I was going to take. And the first thing I did was hire my chief deputy, who by the way is Cynthia Hudson, formerly the city attorney from Hampton, who is doing a great job. And I am real proud of the work she's doing, and my second decision was to hire a Solicitor General, Stuart Raphael, uh, from Arlington, who is a, a brilliant lawyer and um, an outstanding appellate advocate. And so that was in late December, and uh, I immediately tasked him with leading the legal team that would bring together the very best analysis 
analysis we had, all of the case authorities we could pull together, all of the best arguments, pro, con, and everything in between. And he, had, he headed up that team, we worked together, and ultimately, ultimately I concluded that Virginia's ban violated the Equal Protection and Due Process Clauses of the 14th Amendment. Um, now I'll take kind of a, a uh, you know, we, we obviously have a lot of uh, nuanced arguments in the, in the uh, briefs that were filed in the lower court as well as the Fourth Circuit, but kind of from a high altitude uh, viewpoint, I think a lot of these marriage cases represent the intersection of two important lines of Supreme Court authority. The first one is a long-standing line of authority going back to 1888 when the Supreme Court uh, held that marriage is a fundamental right. And it is held time after time after time. Marriage is a fundamental right. And I'll just pick three cases to mention. Loving versus Virginia, which I think most of us are familiar with, decided in 1967. Um, Zablocki versus Redhill, a case out of Wisconsin where the Supreme Court, again, reaffirmed the fundamental right, or reaffirmed the right to marry uh, in a case where Wisconsin had said uh, if an individual is behind and in arrears in their child support, they can't marry. And the court struck that down. Uh, the Turner versus Safley case out of Michigan, uh, which involved a prisoner. And, and, the, and, and in, in Michigan, I'm sorry, in uh, Missouri, um, where the rules prohibited inmates from marrying. And the Supreme Court said even prisoners have the right to marry. And the reason I pick out those, those three cases is because in, in Loving versus Virginia, the court didn't say that uh, it was establishing a fundamental right to gay marriage. I'm mean, sorry, to interracial marriage. Um, it said there's a fundamental right to marry. And it can't be denied someone because of their race. And in Zablocki, uh, it didn't set some kind of new kind of marriage for uh, parents who are behind in child support. It said individuals have a right to marry, and you've got to have, the state has to have a very good reason for denying that right. And in the Turner case, uh, in prisoner inmates, it didn't say there's a fundamental right to prisoner inmate marriage. It said there's a fundamental right to marry, and the state needs to have a very good reason in order to take that right away. Now, the other line of cases is a newer one, and it's a line of cases that uh, the Supreme Court has begun to question laws that discriminate uh, against individuals on the basis of sexual orientation. And uh, one of the, the leading cases is Romer versus Evans in 1996, where the Supreme Court said classifications based on sexual orientation in order to make them unequal violate equal protection. And in Lawrence versus Texas, the laws banning sexual relations, uh, homosexual relations violate due process. And then most recently, in uh, the Windsor case, where the Supreme Court struck down Section 3 of DOMA, saying that it violated both due process and equal protection. And uh, Justice Scalia, in his dissent, well, I disagree with the dissent. I think he was right in his prediction that what the line of cases that had been uh, decided would surely be used to overrule state marriage bans for same-sex couples. And so, in looking at those lines of cases, I was left with the inescapable conclusion that marriage is a fundamental right, and that there was no compelling reason to deny that right based on sexual orientation that Virginia's ban on marriage equality not only uh, can't satisfy that high level of strict scrutiny, but even the most deferential standard under the rational basis test. And um, every single federal court that has ruled on the issue since we made the decision, since I have made that decision, has agreed with uh, that analysis. And that's getting to be a rather long list. Now, the, the, the key underlying principle, in my view, is the equality of right principle. And there is nothing new in that. Equality under the law is one of the cornerstones of American 
jurisprudence. What I think is new is the view, not only in society, but among the courts and the law, about how that equality of right principle applies to citizens who are gay and lesbian and want to marry. And I think the direction that the court is headed is that uh, it reflects what Justice Kennedy wrote in the Lawrence versus Texas case, that our founders knew that times can blind us to certain truths, and that later generations can see that laws once thought necessary and proper, in fact, only serve to oppress. So in a, in a general way, that, that was the legal analysis and conclusion I reached. But for me, as Attorney General, that was not the end of the analysis. It was really, in a way, the beginning. Because I also had to look at what the role and duties of an Attorney General were when confronting a state law, whether in statute or in, in the state constitution, and in this case it was both. Uh, that I had concluded after an independent and rigorous legal analysis violated the United States Constitution. And like we're all taught in law school, when in doubt, look it up. And so I did a lot of research on the topic. Stewart and his team did a lot of research on the topic. And what we found was, while different attorneys general have approached that differently in different situations, that there was a long-standing tradition among attorneys general and executives of not defending laws that they concluded were unconstitutional. And that there were a large number of official opinions from the Office of Legal Counsel, as well as state cases from around the country over not just decades, but centuries. On that, that point, and of course, in Virginia, when you can cite to Thomas Jefferson, it always helps. <laughs> and wouldn't you know, it was Thomas Jefferson who laid that principle down. Um, if you remember, during the Adams administration, uh, the Congress passed the Sedition Act, making it a crime to criticize a federal official. And he prosecuted Americans under that. When Jefferson was elected, however, Jefferson believed that that law violated the First Amendment right to free speech, and he concluded that the Constitution did not require him to enforce an unconstitutional law that violated the Bill of Rights, and he didn't enforce it. And not only that, he didn't continue prosecutions that were brought under the Adams administration. And ultimately, he was proven right, and the Supreme Court struck the law down. Uh, that's not only true in the federal system, but it's true in the state system, and we've found cases all across the country, and even my predecessor, uh, just a year or two, uh, did not defend Sorry, the so-called state takeover law because he believed it was unconstitutional, violating the state constitution, <coughs> and uh, that is an instance in which I voted against that law, both on policy grounds and because I thought it was unconstitutional, and uh, in what was certainly a wild week in Purple Virginia last week, um, a Norfolk judge struck the state takeover law down as violating the state constitution. Um, even in the Windsor case, a group of bipartisan former solicitors general and former Justice Department officers filed an amicus brief saying that the president and the attorney general uh, in that case acted entirely properly and within their, their scope of authority and not defending the law and arguing that the law should be struck down while at the same time enforcing it to make it a justiciable case. Um, likewise, a group of state constitutional scholars filed an amicus brief in the Fourth Circuit in the Windsor case, I'm sorry, in the, in the Boston case, saying that the actions that I took as Attorney General were entirely proper and well within the authority of the Attorney General. Now, because I'll only, I'll only mention this because there apparently seems to be some question out there um, about my oath of office. Uh, and I've heard some people say, but he took an oath to support the state constitution. Um, glossing over the fact that uh, the oath of office was to support the 
Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of Virginia. And as we're all taught not only in law school, but also in grade school, when the two of those conflict, the United States Constitution prevails. I also wanted to mention something about my commitment to the rule of law and my belief in our nation's adversarial system of justice. Um, in looking at the duties of Attorney General and, and the power to not defend a law that is unconstitutional, I thought it was important to make sure, though, that in this case, uh, there were parties there with very able counsel who would be arguing the legality of Virginia's ban. And there were two independently elected clerks with very able counsel, one of them a very well-respected law firm from here in Virginia Beach, and another uh, uh, affiliated with a national organization whose mission is in part to defend these kinds of marriage bans in, in court. And so there were already very capable lawyers who would be arguing zealously that the ban in Virginia should uh, be legal. And I also made sure that it would be a court that would make that decision. And so uh, I, I made sure that the law was continuing to be enforced and executed until a judge ruled. And it is because of my commitment to the rule of law and my belief in our nation's adversarial system of justice that I made sure that in this case, while I changed the state's legal position, that those other positions were still argued and that it was the judicial branch that made the determination about whether this law was constitutional or not. So, while I think it is fair to argue the merits of the case, um, I don't think that what is up for debate is whether my actions were consistent with the rule of law um, and that I acted with the utmost fidelity to my oath, my office, and our profession. Um, that's not to say that there haven't been some who have tried to say that, um, but I really don't think they have uh, studied the role of the Attorney General that deeply, and I think they're probably in disagreement with marriage equality. And that criticism, incidentally, I think pales, pales in comparison to the groundswell of support I have received for the actions and decisions I've taken also from a lot of people I never would have expected. Uh, people have come up to me in the stands at my son's basketball games and said, hey, I just wanted you to know not all Republicans disagree with what you're doing. I will never forget the conversations that I have had with parents who have come up to me and told me that the day I announced that the state was changing its position in the marriage equality cases, their son or their daughter called them in tears because it meant so much to them to know that their attorney general was standing up for them and fighting for their rights. And like the veteran who wrote me from the valley, he wrote and said he hoped that he and his partner of more than 30 years would be able to marry in their home state of Virginia in time for his father-in-law, a World War II vet, to see it. Or the college student from Southwest Virginia who said he was too young to vote on the amendment, but as a gay teenager, he remembered it, and he remembered how it made him feel singled out and further pushed into concealing his identity from his friends, his family, and his community. So while I don't think there is any reasonable doubt about the power of an attorney general to not defend a law that he believes in good faith is unconstitutional. I do think that power needs to be used sparingly and judiciously with due respect for the separation of powers. And in this case, it was entirely justified. Because not only did I conclude that if this case were presented to the United States Supreme Court, that the court would probably strike the law down. Thousands and thousands of Virginians' fundamental 
constitutionally protected rights were being deprived. And Virginia has a very unique history when it comes to civil rights. Now, I know all of us as Virginians are very proud of our history and the contributions our forefathers made to liberty and the founding of our country and our representative democracy, Jefferson, Madison, Mason, and many, many others. But I think all of us can agree that there have been times in our state's history when it has been courageous Virginians who have led the way on civil rights. And many of our elected officials, including some of our previous attorney general, have stood in their way. If you look at the Brown versus Board of Education case in 1954, and if you remember, Brown versus Board was actually a group of cases, one of them from Prince Edward County. Um, as an aside, any of you, uh, if you have not yet visited the Moton Museum in Carville, you really need to see it. Um, a group of brave students at the Moton School uh, protested the inequality of public education, and from that came a court case out of Prince Edward County that was grouped with the Brown versus Board cases. Virginia was on the wrong side of that and argued against school desegregation. And then later in the Loving versus Virginia case, where the Lovings, a couple from Caroline County, wanted to get married, and Virginia said no, because they were of different races. Virginia was on the wrong side of that case and argued against it. And as recently as 1996, Virginia argued against gender equality in public higher education in the, the BMI case. And in each of those cases, Virginia was on the wrong side of key landmark Supreme Court cases on civil rights. One of the great missions of attorneys general is the pursuit of justice. And because of that, there are key moments when actions or decisions that an attorney general makes says something really important about us as a commonwealth and who we are. And I was determined to show that Virginia has moved forward and that the injustices of Virginia's position in those past landmark civil rights cases would not be repeated this time. I was determined to make sure that our commonwealth meaning the people of Virginia were on the right side of the law and on the right side of history. I would like to take just a few minutes as I begin to close um, to put the work we've done on this very important case into context of the overall approach that I brought to the office. I believe the law should be there to help people and to protect them, and that it should be working for all Virginians. And what you're seeing now is that, and what you're going to continue to see, and what Virginians are going to see in the months and years ahead, is that we have an attorney general who is doing those things that a modern attorney general should be doing. Um, I think most of us are probably lawyers in the room. A modern attorney general is going to make sure that his or her law office is functioning efficiently and effectively. Yeah. When I got in first week in office, somebody who had been working on an issue, I think two days, finished up and went to his assistant and said, so where do I put this file? And the answer back was, I guess in your drawer. There's no document management system, there's no file management system, and our case management system is rudimentary at best. So I have brought in an outside, nonpartisan team to do a top to bottom review of our management and operations to make sure that our office uses the best technology, that we have the, the most current uh, operations and functions so that we can be good stewards of taxpayer dollars, operate effectively, efficiently, and deliver the best legal services we can to the Commonwealth. 
in the area of public safety, a modern Attorney General looks not only to the public safety challenges that we've been experiencing in the past, but looks at what, what's going on today and prepares for the public safety challenges of tomorrow. Technology is changing rapidly. And the way criminals are using technology now, they have tools that they didn't have before to victimize people. And, and people are using technology to draw in our young people into the sex trade and exploiting them using online technology in ways that you couldn't imagine. Gangs are moving farther and farther away from, from signs and territory and moving into organized crime and using social media to recruit new members and using the new communications tools to advance their organized crime activities. And people are being threatened by hackers and they can lose their identity just by shopping. And so that's why we're retooling part of our public safety office to make sure that we have an effective e-crimes unit who can go out and help local law enforcement address these new and emerging threats and make sure that we expand our use of multi-jurisdictional grand juries to prosecute some of those organized crimes and gangs and human trafficking and sex trafficking where they expand multiple jurisdictions. And a modern attorney general makes sure that we have a business climate where our main street businesses can thrive alongside of our high-tech employers. And that's why uh, I've worked hard to make sure that we had good legislation to protect against abuse of, of patent trolls and, and uh, our patents and intellectual property. And speaking of business competitiveness, it is critically important that we harness the enormous talent and human capital we have in Virginia. And neither federal law nor anything in our in-state tuition law prohibits the children of immigrants who the federal government has now said are lawfully present in Virginia from establishing domicile and getting in-state tuition. These are bright students who have overcome language barriers. They have grown up in Virginia. They have succeeded in Virginia high schools. They want to continue their education begin climbing the ladder of success and achieve the American dream, and the Virginia I know will continue to give them those opportunities. And yes, a modern Attorney General will make sure that the Commonwealth is an open and welcoming place for all who would call it home. So after five months, uh, if you can't tell already, um, I'll tell you that I absolutely love the job. I love the law, I love public policy, and I love helping people. And as Attorney General, you get to do all three of those things every single moment you're awake. And I absolutely love it. I appreciate the opportunity to share a few thoughts on marriage equality. I hope you have a productive panel, an informative panel discussion. And uh, thank you for inviting me. And have a